one. Suppose I were to begin by saying that I had fallen in love with a color. Suppose I were to speak this as though it were a confession. Suppose I shredded my napkin as we spoke. It began slowly, an appreciation and affinity. Then one day it became more serious. Then, looking into an empty teacup, its bottom stained with thin brown excrement coiled into the shape of a seahorse, it became somehow personal. Two. And so I fell in love with the color, in this case the color blue, as if falling under a spell, a spell I fought to stay under and get out from under, in turns. 3. Well, and what of it? A voluntary delusion, you might say, that each blue object could be a kind of burning bush, a secret code meant for a single agent an X on a map too diffuse ever to be unfolded in entirety, but that contains the knowable universe. How could all the shreds of blue garbage bags stuck in brambles, or the bright blue tarps flapping over every shanty and fish stand in the world, be, in essence, the fingerprints of God? I will try to explain this. 4. I admit that I may have been lonely. I know that loneliness can produce bolts of hot pain, a pain which, if it stays hot enough for long enough, can begin to simulate or to provoke, take your pick, an apprehension of the divine. This ought to arouse our suspicions. Seventeen. But what goes on in you, when you talk about color as if it were a cure, when you have not yet stated your disease? 18. A warm afternoon in early spring, New York City. We went to the Chelsea Hotel to fuck. Afterward, from the window of our room, I watched a blue tarp on a roof across the way flap in the wind. You slept, so it was my secret. It was a smear of the quotidian, a bright blue flake amidst all the dank providence. It was the only time I came. It was essentially our lives. 22. Some things do change, however. A membrane can simply rip off your life, like a skin of congealed paint torn off the top of a can. I remember that day very clearly. I had received a phone call. A friend had been in an accident. Perhaps she would not live. She had very little face, and her spine was broken in two places. She had not yet moved. The doctor described her as a pebble in water. I walked around Brooklyn and noticed that the faded periwinkle of the abandoned mobile gas station on the corner was suddenly blooming. In the baby shit yellow showers at my gym, where snow sometimes fluttered in through the cracked gated windows, I noticed that the yellow paint was peeling in spots and a decent industrial blue was trying to creep in. At the bottom of the swimming pool, I watched the white winter light spangle the cloudy blue, and I knew, together they made God. When I walked into my friend's hospital room, her eyes were a piercing pale blue and the only part of her body that could move. I was scared. So was she. The blue was beating. 23. Goethe wrote Theory of Colors in a period of his life described by one critic as a long interval marked by nothing of distinguished note. Goethe himself describes the period as one in which a quiet, collected state of mind was out of the question. Goethe is not alone in turning to color at a particularly fraught moment. Think of filmmaker Derek Jarman, who wrote his book Chroma as he was going blind and dying of AIDS, a death he also forecast on film as disappearing into a blue screen. Or of Wittgenstein, who wrote his remarks on color during the last 18 months of his life while dying of stomach cancer. He knew he was dying. He could have chosen to work on any philosophical problem under the sun. He chose to write about color. About color and pain. Much of this writing is urgent, opaque, and uncharacteristically boring. That which I am writing about so tediously may be obvious to someone whose mind is less decrepit, he wrote. So what would it be a symptom of to start seeing colors, or more oddly, just one color, more acutely? Mania? 
monomania, hypomania, shock, love, grief. 27. But why bother with diagnoses at all, if a diagnosis is but a restatement of the problem? 28. It was around this time that I first had the thought, we fuck well because he is a passive top and I am an active bottom. I never said this out loud, but I thought it often. I had no idea how true it would prove or how painful outside of the fucking. 29. If a color cannot cure, can it at least incite hope? The blue collage you sent me so long ago from Africa, for example, made me hopeful. But not to be honest because of its blues. 36. Goethe describes blue as a lively color, but one devoid of gladness. It may be said to disturb rather than enliven. Is to be in love with blue then to be in love with a disturbance? Or is the love itself the disturbance? And what kind of madness is it anyway to be in love with something constitutionally incapable of loving you back? 37. Are you sure one would like to ask that it cannot love you back? 78. Once I traveled to the Tate in London to see the blue paintings of Eve Klein who invented and patented his own shade of ultramarine, International Klein Blue, IKB, then painted canvases and objects with it throughout a period of his life he dubbed L'Epoque Blue. Standing in front of these blue paintings, or propositions, at the Tate, feeling their blue radiate out so hotly that it seemed to be touching, perhaps even hurting my eyeballs, I wrote but one phrase in my notebook, too much. I had come all this way, and I could barely look. Perhaps I had inadvertently brushed up against the Buddhist axiom that enlightenment is the ultimate disappointment. From the mountain, you see the mountain, wrote Emerson. 79. For just because one loves blue does not mean that one wants to spend one's life in a world made of it. Life is a train of moods like a string of beads, and as we pass through them, they prove to be many colored lenses which paint the world their own hue and each shows only what lies in its focus, wrote Emerson. To find oneself trapped in any one bead, no matter what its hue, can be deadly. 85. One afternoon in 2006, at a bookstore in Los Angeles, I pick up a book called The Deepest Blue. Having expected a chromatic treatise, I am embarrassed when I see the subtitle, How Women Face and Overcome Depression. I quickly return it to its shelf. Eight months later, I ordered the book online. 86. The implication of the title is that men get blue, but women get the deepest blue. Another form of aggrandizement, to be sure. One which brings to mind a night I spent in an emergency room in Brooklyn years ago. Some mystery ailment, a burning in my lower left side. A woman wailing in the waiting room about having gas from fried chicken though she looked riddled with crack and sadness, not gas from fried chicken. A young doctor inside asked me to rate my pain on a scale of 1 to 10. I was flummoxed. I felt as though I shouldn't be there at all. I said 6. He said to the nurse, write down 8, since women always underestimate their pain. Men always say 11, he said. I didn't believe him, but I supposed he might know. 102. After my friend's accident, I take care of her. It is always taking care, but it is difficult, because at times to take care of her is also to cause her pain. For two years, to get her in and out of her wheelchair, we have to perform a complicated maneuver called the transfer. The transfer often sends her legs into excruciating spasms, during which time all I can do is press down on them and say, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, until the shaking stops. She has diffuse nerve pain along the surface of her skin, which no doctor understands. Pain, she says, makes her skin feel like crinkly, burning saran wrap. We look at her skin together as she describes this pain. 103. When the pain is bad, it drains her color. When it breaks through the drugs, of which there are many, she says it feels like a scrim goes up between her and the rest of the world. 
In my mind's eye, I imagine it as an invisible jacket of burn hovering between us. 104. I do not feel my friend's pain, but when I unintentionally cause her pain, I wince as if I hurt somewhere, and I do. Often in exhaustion, I lay my head down on her lap in her wheelchair and tell her how much I love her, that I'm so sorry she is in so much pain, pain I can witness and imagine, but that I do not know. She says, if anyone knows this pain besides me, it is you and Jay, her lover. This is generous, for to be close to her pain has always felt like a privilege to me, even though pain could be defined as that which we typically aim to avoid. Perhaps this is because she remains so generous within hers, and because she has never held any hierarchy of grief, either before her accident or after, which seems to me nothing less than a form of enlightenment. Over time, my injured friend's feet have become blue and smooth from disuse. Their blue is the blue of skim milk, their smoothness that of a baby's. I think they look and feel very strange and beautiful. She does not agree. How could she? This is her body, its transformations, her grief. Often we examine parts of her body together, as if their paralysis had rendered them objects of inquiry independent of us both. But they are still hers. No matter what happens to our bodies in our lifetimes, no matter if they become like pebbles in water, they remain ours, us, theirs. 116. One of the last times you came to see me, you were wearing a pale blue button-down shirt, short-sleeved. I wore this for you, you said. We fucked for six hours straight that afternoon, which does not seem precisely possible, but that is what the clock said. We killed the time. You were on your way to a seaside town, a town of much blue, where you would be spending a week with the other woman you were in love with, the woman you are with now. I'm in love with you both in completely different ways, you said. It seemed unwise to contemplate this statement any further. 145. In German, to be blue, blau sein, means to be drunk. Delirium tremens used to be called the blue devils, as in my bitter hours of blue devilism, Burns, 1787. In England, the blue hour is happy hour at the pub. Joan Mitchell, abstract painter of the First Order, American expatriate living on Monet's property in France, dedicated chromophile and drunk, possessor of a famously nasty tongue, and creator of arguably my favorite painting of all time, Les Bleuets, which she painted in 1973, the year of my birth, found the green of spring incredibly irritating. She thought it was bad for her work. She would have preferred to live perpetually in Le Ours de Bleu. Her dear friend Frank O'Hara understood. Ah, Daddy, I want to stay drunk many days, he wrote, and did. 152. Holiness and evilness aside, no one could rightly call blue a festive color. You don't go looking for a party in a color that hospitals have used to calm crying infants or sedate the emotionally disturbed. Ancient Egyptians wrapped their mummies in blue cloth. Ancient Celtic warriors dyed their bodies with woad before heading off to battle. The Aztecs smeared the chests of their sacrificial victims with blue paint before scooping their hearts out on the altar. The story of indigo is, at least in part, the story of slavery, riots, and misery. Blue does, however, always have a place at the carnival. 153. I've read that children pretty much prefer red hands down over all other colors. The shift into liking cooler tones, such as blue, happens as they grow older. Nowadays, half the adults in the Western world say that blue is their favorite color. In their international survey of the most wanted painting, the Russian emigre team Vitaly Komar and Alex Melamid discovered that country after country, from China to Finland to Germany to the United States to Russia to Kenya to Turkey, most wanted a blue landscape with slight variances a ballerina here, a moose there, and so on. The only exception was Holland, which, for inscrutable reasons, wanted a murky, rainbow-hued abstraction. 156. Why is the sky blue? A fair enough question, and one I have learned the answer to several times. 
Yet every time I try to explain it to someone or remember it to myself, it eludes me. Now I like to remember the question alone, as it reminds me that my mind is essentially a sieve, that I am mortal. 161. Philosopher Bertrand Russell was a fan of Wittgenstein's early work in logic, but he complained that the later Wittgenstein, quote, seems to have grown tired of serious thinking and to have invented the doctrine which would make such an activity unnecessary, end quote. I am not sure if I agree, but I note the temptation. So, I think, did Wittgenstein. Explanations come to an end somewhere, he wrote. 170. Cornell even coined a word to describe the sensation he hoped to produce by blue-tinting his work. Blue A. I have no idea how he pronounced it, which is fine by me. This way it can be blue A like the flower, blue ale like an affliction, or blue eye like Versailles, or blue eye. Unlike Eve Klein, however, Cornell had no urge to patent his invention, which is just as well as you can't yet patent a sensation, thank God. Cornell was a gatherer, not an owner. He was also a builder of bowers, which he called habitats, as befits someone who adored birds. Day. And I gathered fragments of blue dents, he wrote in an undated scribble. 184. Writing is, in fact, an astonishing equalizer. I could have written half of these propositions drunk or high, for instance, and half sober. I could have written half in agonized tears and half in a state of clinical detachment. But now that they have been shuffled around countless times, now that they have been made to appear at long last running forward as one river, how could either of us tell the difference? Two oh seven. I can remember a time when I took Henry James's advice try to be one of the people on whom nothing is lost, deeply to heart. I think I was then imagining that the net effect of becoming one of those people would always be one of accretion. Whereas if you truly become someone on whom nothing is lost, then loss will not be lost upon you either. 226. As I collected blues for this project, in folders, in boxes, in notebooks, in memory, I imagined creating a blue tome, an encyclopedic compendium of blue observations, thoughts, and facts. But as I lay out my collection now, what strikes me most is its anemia, an anemia that seems to stand in direct proportion to my zeal. I thought I had collected enough blue to build a mountain, albeit one of detritus, but it seems to me now as if I have stumbled upon a pile of thin blue gels scattered on the stage long after the show was come and gone, the set, striked. 227. Perhaps this is as it should be. Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, the first and only book of philosophy he published in his lifetime, clocks in at 60 pages and offers a grand total of seven propositions. As to the shortness of the book, I am awfully sorry for it, but what can I do, he wrote to his translator. If you were to squeeze me like a lemon, you would get nothing more out of me. 236. Do not be overly troubled by this fact. Nine days out of ten, Merleau-Ponty wrote about Cezanne. All he saw around him was the wretchedness of his empirical life and of his unsuccessful attempts, the debris of an unknown celebration. 237. In any case, I am no longer counting the days. 238. I want you to know, if you ever read this, that there was a time when I would rather have had you by my side than any one of these words. I would rather have had you by my side than all the blue in the world. 239. But now you are talking as if love were a consolation. Simone Weil warned otherwise. Love is not consolation, Weil wrote. It is light. 240. All right then, let me try to rephrase. When I was alive, I aimed to be a student, not of longing, but of light. <laughs>